I'm Mark Kelly, and I play keyboards in the progressive rock band Marillion. You may not have heard of Marillion, because our most successful song, Kaylee, was released about 28 years ago. We had a number of other top 40 hits, but Kaylee's the one that most people remember. I'm not complaining because that song is part of the reason why I've never had a proper job and I've been able to make a living from music for the last 32 years. The other part is the internet and what we were able to do with it. Most of the music industry, when they woke up, saw the internet as a threat. We saw it as a chance to bring ourselves closer to the people that actually provided us with a living. By 1997, we were in a position that most bands that don't split up find themselves in when their last hit record was 10 years previously. Uh, we were strapped for cash, basically. We were very early adopters of the internet and already had our own website and a mailing list. For those not familiar with the concept of the mailing list, before the days of social sites such as Facebook or Twitter, like-minded people stayed in contact with each other using mailing lists. Now there was a Meridian mailing list called Freaks. His members mostly resided in the USA. I should point out that Freaks is the title of one of our songs, but when I tell you what they did, you'll see the name is quite fitting. Um, after lurking on that list for a couple of years, I became an active member and used to answer questions from people. And one of those questions was, will Marillion be touring the USA this year? And this was in January 97. And I said no, because we just parted company with our old record company, EMI, and they always used to pay the shortfall on a tour, and we always lost money in the States. Um, and our US label had recently gone tips up. So a young fan who was on the list called Jeff Pelletier, he, he suggested that the Freaks could fund our tour by all chipping in a few dollars each. Now, I pointed out that we'd need more than a few dollars. In fact, we'd need about $60,000 to make the tour work. Undeterred, another Jeff, a guy called Jeff Woods, set up a bank account and started, making, uh, started collecting donations. I knew Jeff because he'd been to over 50 Marillion shows and he'd even proposed to his wife in the front row of a show in London <laughs> in front of 3,000 people. <laughs> Thank me, she said yes. <laughs> so I gave Jeff a go ahead and the tour fund was born. Within a few months, he collected close to $20,000 and I thought it was about time I told the rest of the band that we <laughs> might be going on tour in the States that summer. Uh, and a few months later, he'd actually collected the whole $60,000 and the tour was booked. We were amazed by how many people donated to a tour and then bought tickets as well to come and see us. Now, there were even some donations from people outside the USA because once we realised it was actually going to happen, we said, to anybody who donated $10 or more, we'd give you a free CD of one of the shows recorded on the tour. And those CDs now change hands for hundreds of pounds on eBay because there were so few of them made. Very good investment for the people that believed in us at the time. <laughs> the highest single donation we had was from a guy in the UK called Paul Baines. He donated 800 pounds to this tour fund. And I saw him a few years later and I said to him, why did you do that? He said, well, I just thought it was such a cool idea. I wanted to see it succeed. So, let's get a drink, sorry. <laughs> that insight is really important. And it's something I'll come back to later when I summarise the lessons that we learn. And therefore the principles, I think, make for great crowdfunding. So back to my story. The first ever example of crowdfunding, our US tour in 97, was the best we'd ever done in the USA. It was well attended, we had extensive coverage in the media because of the amazing story of how it came about. This was an unforeseen spin-off that we would make use of a few years later. So moving forward to the year 2000, we were still hard up and about to sign ourselves into a few more years of servitude to the man. <laughs> Our last hit record, or well, since our last hit record, our fan base had shrunk to a loyal few hundred thousand from two or three million back in the mid 80s. And we were the perfect cash cow for one of the smaller indie labels at the time. A band with a decent sized fan base and no contract. It did involve them paying us in advance of about 100,000 pounds. Sounds like a lot, but we had to make that money last through the writing and recording process. And then we would deliver the album, they would release it, to our loyal fans and spend as little money as possible 
make a nice tidy profit for themselves. <laughs> we would just about repay the, uh, the advance out of our royalties and then we'd do it all off again the following year. So after about three years of that, in the mid 90s, we were sort of getting a bit fed up with it. So we, we felt used and we wanted out of this arrangement. So I was inspired by the tour fund that happened a few years earlier and I suggested that we ask the fans to pay for the album in advance. This would give us the money we needed to survive whilst writing and recording and we wouldn't have to sign another contract. At the time, we had a database of about 6,000 people, email addresses that was, and about another 15,000 postal addresses. We emailed the 6,000 and asked them the simple question, would they consider paying for the album in advance if we sent it to them when it was ready? In return for their trust and loyalty, we would reward them with a special version of the album. What that one? This one. Uh, most people said yes. Some even said they would order two copies. We calculated that we would raise enough money to make this work, and we decided to take the plunge. This special version was only available to, to the people who pre-ordered it. It came with a 20-page book, and a bonus CD with some extra tracks that were unavailable elsewhere. And anyone who ordered it, in time enough, had their name printed in the credits. Now, oh, that's another one. <laughs> and we took over 12,000 pre-orders for this album. We also released a standard, you know, dual case version through retail with our old label EMI and as there was no advance on this album we were earning royalties from the first copy sold. My partner Angie Moxham owns a PR company and she taught me the value of a good story and this was a good story and it was covered by everybody from the BBC to the broadsheets you know most of the coverage was about crowdfunding not about the music but we didn't mind you know I think Andy Warhol was right when he said don't read your press, wait. <laughs> so, in 2004, we did it all over again. This time, it was a larger format with a double album, a 96 page book, two CDs, and we also then to everyone who, who pre ordered into a draw, give them a chance to win everything from backstage passes to lunch with the band, or a chance to even sing or play on the album. Now, that lucky winner actually didn't sing or play anything. So we gave her a triangle and she did a little bit. <laughs> it's true, on one of the tracks. And, and we were all happy, so that was great. Putting people's names in the book personalised it for them. It was a way of saying it's thanks, but it's normal for, to thank people when, when you make an album by putting their names in a sleeve. The only difference with us was this thanks list ran to 32 pages. We took over 16,000 pre-orders and cleared nearly £300,000 profit after manufacturing and postage costs. Instead of going on holiday though, we reinvested it. And we had a really decent marketing campaign, the best we've had since leaving EMI back in 95. And we scored a top 10 hit in the UK, and it was our first hit since the 80s. Although we had a decent budget to spend, we didn't waste the money. We drew on the army of fans and supporters in other ways too. Some volunteered to have their cars wrapped the Meridian Anthos from top to bottom. <coughs> we played for the wrapping and they drove around proudly advertising Meridian. <laughs> we also organised street teams to distribute Meridian rated stuff. We spread the word at other bands, gigs and festivals. Many put up posters and stickers. It's all legal, of course. <laughs> we'd, we'd achieved the financial self-sufficiency that most bands only dream about. So in 1997, sorry, 2007, with our 15th studio album, Somewhere Else, we decided not to do a pre-order. We didn't need the money, so we figured there was no need. Many fans told us they were disappointed about our decision. They liked the pre-orders, they liked the special versions, even though it was more expensive. They liked having their names in the book. They also liked being involved in the whole process. The pre-order was, it added to the excitement and the anticipation they felt for a new Marillion album. So we'd learned a valuable lesson. Crowdfunding isn't just about funding. For the people doing the funding, it's about much more. When I thought of the idea of doing this pre-order campaign, it was, it was the loop I was thinking of. And I'm not talking about Henry VIII's favourite guitar either. <laughs> Speaking of money, for our most recent pre-order campaign, last year we ran into problems. In June 2009, as much as £300 million had to be repaid to ticket holders for the 50 London shows that didn't happen when Michael Jackson sadly beat it. Um, <laughs> since then, the credit card companies are wary of handing over money for goods or services paid for in advance in case they have to foot the bill and something goes wrong. It was only after thousands of Marillion fans 
had paid their money, did World Pay, the company we used at the time, inform us that they'd be keeping the money until we'd shipped the CDs. We managed to come to an agreement with them whereby they gave us some of the money in order for us to manufacture so we could actually fulfill the orders when the time came. It's this has happened to us in 2001, when we made our first attempt at crowdfunding, it would have been a disaster. We, as we were spending the money as quickly as it came in just to keep the good ship really in the flow. So this brings me on to another important aspect of crowdfunding, trust. The people who agreed to join us in that experiment trusted us to deliver the goods and not just keep the money. I think the crowdfunding was an idea whose time had come. If I hadn't thought of it, somebody else would have. But since I thought of it first, I'm something of a crowdfunding purist. You know, just like the people that follow a band and nobody's heard of them, and then when they have a hit and they become a household name, they go, oh, they've sold out. Well, for me, crowdfunding's sold out. <laughs> so, some people see it as a way to invest, to take a punt on an idea or a person, without really believing in it. As far as I'm concerned, that's just high-risk gambling. And the only sure winner is the house, in this case, the crowdfunding company. I'm only sort of half serious here, actually, but there are some companies out there that care little about the quality of the projects they accept or their likelihood of success. Their percentage, they, they're just interested in, in collecting their percentage of the funds invested. So beware. To me, crowdfunding is about relationship built on respect and trust. The people who fund Beryllium want to be part of something special. They support and believe in us. They want us to help us succeed. Many artists suffer from peer-to-peer -peer file sharing, people stealing their music. The people that pre-order our albums did so in the knowledge that the money was coming to us and we were going to spend it making the best album possible. Through our pre-order model, we established a direct relationship with our fans. When you have a relationship with, with somebody, you don't steal from them. Many illegal file sharers justify their activities by telling themselves that the artists are being ripped off by the record companies. So, what's the problem? Well, there's probably some truth in that. Hmm? But a good record company also performs an important role in investing in new talent. At its peak, the music industry had six major labels. With the recent acquisition of EMI by Universal, that number has now been reduced to three. So will crowdfunding companies take over the role of investing in new talent and encouraging new bands? I'm not sure about the answer to that, but I know that, that uh, replacing one middleman with another is not the solution. But when somebody has a good idea, there's always gonna be someone else who thinks they can profit from it. We thought about offering our services to other artists, but decided against it because we're musicians who want to make music and anything that doesn't directly support that goal is a distraction. Possibly inspired by our success, however, many companies have sprung up offering different variations of the crowdfunding model. Some in music and movies or the wider arts. And there seems to be no limit to what can be funded in this way. Mobile apps, old style mad professor inventions, wind farms, local community projects. Today there are over 300 different crowdfunding companies in existence. And as you would expect, they aren't all success stories. In early 2010, a crowdfunding company called Celeband went bust and was taken over by a former Sony BMG executive and continues to operate today. I find it slightly ironic that the idea I thought of to free us from the shackles of a middleman record company is now being used by a record company executive <laughs> to put himself firmly back in the middle again. <laughs> Last month, the US website Gorka started a crowdfunding campaign nicknamed Crackstarter to raise $200,000 in order to buy a video from a drug dealer of the mayor of Toronto, Rob Ford, smoking crack. <laughs> Rumour has it the drug dealer's been shot dead, so Rob and his job are safer now. <laughs> Kickstarter is the best known crowdfunding company, and they encourage people to invest in creative projects like music or movies. They're more selective than some, and since starting in 2009, they've had over 300 million pounds go through their books into various projects. That sort of success attracts scammers and con men. Kickstarter, like eBay, have had to introduce various measures to make it harder for scammers to trick the gullible. Whilst I accept that doing it all yourself isn't for everyone, 
when other do-it-yourself crowdfunders <coughs> don't have this problem. Many people know that Thomas Edison stole a few of his inventions. He's probably best known for inventing the light bulb, <laughs> which was in fact invented by Joseph Swan here in the UK. Edison copied Swan's invention and patented it in the USA. It's less well known that Galileo didn't invent a telescope. It was invented by a Dutch bloke called Hans um, something or other. <laughs> <laughs> and Alexander Graham Bell didn't invent the telephone either. Antonio Nucci did, an Italian. He made the mistake of calling it the Teletrofono. Not a very snappy name, so he's forgotten about. Anyway, I'm not the only person to, invent, to have to claim to have invented crowdfunding. Across the pond in 2003, the owner of a company called Artist Share filed a crowdfunding patent that same year. The patent was granted in 2009, and he set about attempting to collect license fees from his more successful competitors. This resulted in a court case with Kickstarter that has yet to be resolved. I'll be watching that one closely. So, to recap what I've been talking about and what I want to leave you with to help you if you think crowdfunding is something that you could benefit from. The three key principles for successful crowdfunding are, number one, love, not money. It has to be something people believe in and get excited about. If you're just chasing the money, I honestly don't think it'll work. You have to create a fan base of people who are motivated, like you, about the cause and not simply the financial return. Number two, do it yourself. Working with a crowdfunding company may be the best option for you if you've invented something like a, I don't know, a lawnmower that cuts the grass by itself. But if, if, you, if you're making music or any other arts project, you're still gonna to have to go out there and find the fan base. The crowdfunding company won't do it for you. Also remember, they'll keep your data at the end, which is valuable. Number three, Make it special. Make it personal. Give your funders something they can't get any other way. That may be a special edition of your product, as in our case, or it might be privileged access to you or your services. If you do all of the above, you will obey the most important rule of, of successful crowdfunding. You'll build trust with your funders. So thank you to all the Meridian fans for their faith, their funding, and for being the original crowdfunding freaks. Thank <laughs> you.